Well, this was kind of a fun topic that I was assigned to do. Doctor, would you please talk about folk remedies? And I kind of went into it kicking and screaming, but as I started to write it, it was kind of actually fun because it, it made me begin to think about what it is that I do with patients and kind of which world I live in in terms of uh, what is conventional medicine, what is alternative medicine, what is integrative medicine, what is folk medicine or folk remedies. And so, and then I began to think about how do we know when something works? What is the basis upon which we judge the effectiveness of a treatment? And then that made me think about when I was growing up, and I'll just go ahead and read a couple of these. And I'd be interested as I read these, if, you, if any of you think of any stories from your youth or your life that represents pretty uh, impressive folk remedies, uh, we have microphones and Tiffany will be around. I'd, I'd, I'd welcome you to share some of that with us. Hopefully today we'll, we'll all share in this discussion because it's not like what I'm going to say has a single hard and fast answer. It's really, it opens up probably more questions than it does give answers. But anyway, I remember when I was little and I would get the flu. Of course, I got to stay home <clears throat> from school and my mom would give me 7-Up and, and malts and that was really pretty good. And I got to read comic books and play hooky and, and I got better. So what, which was it? Was it the staying home from school? Was it the 7-Up and malts? Was it mom kind of doting over me? Was it the comic books? I don't know. Uh, which part of that experience, or was I going to get better anyway? That's the other big question that a lot of people have is that, okay, here's all these remedies. Were you going to get better anyway? I don't know. I remember one of the doctors that I first worked with, uh, up in Minneapolis, Kansas. I had done my internship and I was working with these doctors and we were standing out and the receptionist pulled one of the doctors aside and said, uh, such and such is calling in with a sore throat. Should we get them in right away? And he says, yeah, get them in before they get better. And so, <clears throat> Grandpa Joe was, uh, was my grandfather and he, uh, he amazed us with a lot of interesting things, and one of the things I can remember growing up with him talking about was his whorehound candy. Candy. Who of you have had whorehound candy? Kind of an interesting herbal remedy. He said it would cure sore throats and coughs, and I'm sure, you know, if you, if you had a cough or a sore throat and you sucked on that candy, it probably made your throat feel better, and, and maybe there was something in the herb that uh, reduced the inflammation and promoted a healing response. We're using a lot of herbs nowadays, and we do know from scientific evidence that herbs do promote uh, immune improvements and anti-inflammatory effects, so maybe he was on the right track. So then there was my uh, roommate who uh, took me to his house up in Iowa, and his dad was a distinguished banker, and every morning I, I thought it was interesting. I, I was just in college then, so I had no medical training, but every morning he, he would start off the day with uh, a big glass of water in which he would put a jigger full of uh, apple cider vinegar and a tablespoon of honey and stir it up and drink it, and I asked him what he was taking that for, and it was for his arthritis. How many of you have heard of apple cider vinegar and honey for arthritis? How many of you have tried that? Does it work? He, he was very faithful about taking it. I never did sit down with him and do a statistical analysis, and I'm not sure how many people have actually done statistical double-blind. It's kind of hard to do a double-blind placebo-controlled study on apple cider vinegar and honey. So uh, then there's Dr. Reardon. Dr. Reardon was, was kind of famous for doing some what I thought were rather odd things. Uh, patients would come in with a, a, a mole that looked suspicious or maybe it was uh, some kind of growth on their skin and instead of having them immediately go to the dermatologist have it cut off he would have them make up their own blend of about a tablespoon of organic castor oil and about uh, 3,000 milligrams of B6 powder 
and mix that all together and several times a day dab it on their skin. And, you th and then he would say, that's going to help get rid of it. And that seems fairly, imp it seemed fairly implausible to me the first time I heard him say that or suggest that. And I, then I do remember that uh, a former head of our laboratory, her husband was a roofer. And he, you know, roofers are notorious for being up roofing with their shirts off in the summer, getting a lot of sun exposure. And lo and behold, he came in to see us with a huge black mole on the back of his back. I would say it was maybe about uh, three quarters of an inch across. Certainly did look melanoma-ish to me. Uh, and Dr. Reardon says, get some castor oil and some B6 and rub that on there twice a day. And, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, that's, uh, is that dangerous, you know, to be using something that sounded to me like just a folk remedy on something that I thought could otherwise be life-threatening. And, uh, and then what was even more surprising to me was about three or four weeks later, his, this guy's first name was Dick. Dick came in and he said, oh, that thing on my back is really swollen and sore. And I said, let me look at it. And, and it had turned bright red. It was, it was very red and swollen all the way around it. And I thought he had an infection in it. And so I, had even, I even put him on an antibiotic. Um, but Dr. Reardon said, no, that is the immune response attacking the mole. So I said, okay, Dr. Reardon. And so, I, so he kept up with the treatment and I had him come in and we have in our library somewhere a series of photographs because as time went on, not only did the redness increase, <clears throat> but it actually began to, we began to see the darkness of the mole, melanoma, start to break up and, uh, and it gradually got lighter and the swelling went down and it eventually went away. And this was like probably 15, 16 years ago. Uh, I went back about a year ago, got a, got a hold of his wife. I was talking to her about, she, she had gotten her degree as a physician's assistant and I was talking to her about possibly coming here to work. Who greeted me at the door? It was Dick. And any problems, Dick? Nope. Fine, doing well. So if that if that was just a mole, so we don't know. He never did. He never did want to have it biopsied. He used this home remedy. It got worse before it got better, but then it got better. And so uh, there's a lot of stories like that. I, I know uh, Andrew Weil talks. He has a story in his books. This is a book called Natural Health, Natural Medicine about someone with. Um, MS that was working outside in their garden and they accidentally got into a hornet's nest and got severely stung all over and had severe reactions and so many weeks later their MS cleared up and there is a there is now a therapy apotherapy where there are people around who you can go to their hives and they will sting you they'll have their bees purposely sting you so many times in the hopes that it will induce some kind of an immune response that will help you heal from this from autoimmune conditions like MS or um, <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis or those kind of things. So um, one more story that's just really interesting that kind of throws into question, you know, what is a folk remedy and what is a, a, a medical therapy? Uh, this was probably back in the mid-90s that we had a woman come in and by that point in time, people knew that Dr. Reardon was doing work with cancer patients so she came in to announce to someone at the front desk that she had drank an Indian tea remedy for her ovarian cancer, and it had completely healed. And so uh, Dr. Reardon's son, Neil, was working with us at that time, and so uh, she, he went up to check this out, and she said, yeah, it's an Indian remedy, and it was uh, bindweed tea. How many of you are familiar with bindweed? It's, it's a very common so-called nuisance in most farmers' fields that uh, easily gets uh, spread around as cultivation is done and whatnot. And, and Neil knew that we had a lot of bindweed here. We have a 90-acre area at the, at the Reardon Clinic that uh, has never, to our, well, it may have been in the past, but since the clinic has been here, it's never been sprayed. And so we thought we had quite a bit of organic bindweed available. 
And so I remember one Friday afternoon, all 35 of the staff was out with uh, plastic trash bags collecting bindweed. And then Neil proceeded to go ahead and uh, boil all this down into a bindweed extract. And Dr. Xiaolong Ming, who's one of our cancer researchers, has a very elegant experiment where he uh, put the bindweed on, uh, there was a, uh, he took an egg and started a tumor growing on it. And when he put the bindweed extract on it, the, the uh, blood vessels stopped growing to the, to the tumor. In other words, it was an anti-angiogenic type therapy. And so he actually, we actually have that upstairs as uh, C-statin. And it's a bindweed extract that we believe and we have evidence for that it acts in some ways as an antiogenic, antiogenic therapy. And so uh, a lot of our cancer patients will use this in conjunction or as an adjunctive therapy to whatever kind of care they're receiving. So did that take it from the realm of folk medicine into medicine? Now, pr probably not a lot of oncologists that are using bindweed extract, but they're certainly using a number of other naturally derived substances that uh, do have antiogenic, antiogenic angiogenic uh, activity. So, so sometimes what, what we thought was just a folk remedy that had no basis to it, when the deeper investigation is done, there can be actual mechanisms discovered that, that uh, display how it works or discerns how it works to help the patient. So this is how we kind of ask this question, what is real and what is imagined? What, how much of what we're doing in the realm of folk medicine is truly something that is changing the underlying physiology of the body and improving the uh, chances of healing occurring and how much of it is the placebo effect. So how many of you, you've all heard of the placebo, haven't you? So there are a lot of doctors now that have given it a new name, uh, the human healing response, because it turns out that you can pharmacologically block the placebo effect. There are actual receptors that your body makes a chemical that when you uh, entertain the therapy in the correct way, it induces your body to make these uh, endorphins. And these endorphins can, can actually uh, reduce pain and improve healing. And so, and I'm sure most of you have heard of endorphin endorphin highs, whether you go dancing or if you, the runner's high or certain uh, laugh therapy. People who, there are, there are there's, there's a group over in India called, they, they call it laughter yoga, where the, the, the yogi basically takes the group and starts them laughing and they just laugh for 20 to 30 minutes hysterically and people feel so much better. And, and maybe you've experienced that. Uh, I, I know my family has with my jokes. Uh, so, <laughs> but anyway, endorphins can be blocked pharmacologically. There are substances that block morphine. And it turns out these receptors are very similar in nature to a morphine. Matter of fact, the endorphin receptors is where the morphine works. So if you take Narcan, or naltrexone in a high enough dose, it will block the endorphin receptors and the placebo effect doesn't work anymore. So then we start to get an idea that maybe folk remedies, even though they may in and of themselves not have a lot of strength or toxicity or apparent power, maybe they are inducing a deeper healing response in humans. And maybe that's all humans had up until about the 18th century because uh, a lot of what went on in the field of medicine, when we look back at the history of medicine, some of it was very valid. I mean, uh, certainly uh, uh, Hipp Hippocrates had some very good ideas about nutrition, you know, let food be your medicine. And he, he was a very close observer of what people were doing. And, uh, but then they also had some strange ideas about the humors, that if you were sick, you had bad humors. Of course, my family, again, thinks I have bad humors as well. But uh, nevertheless, I think there are, there's a lot of different ways of characterizing how we think about the healing process. So today, what I've done is I've kind of put some of that up and so that for all of us to consider. By the way, anyone have any really great folk remedy story that you wanted to tell the group? Well, if you think of it, let me know. 
So anyway, what is a folk remedy? Well, folks is just common folks like us, right? We're not, not necessarily doctors or scientists or medical experts. Certainly, there's a lot of grandmas out there, and, and there's a lot of uh, women in the community. It used to be the, the women in the community were the, were the healers. And then that kind of went in. Some, there are obviously some cultures. It was the witch doctor that was the healer. Uh, but this were, these were, you know, more often than not, it's just common people who are maybe out in the country, like our, our pioneers. They didn't have a doctor handy, so they had to rely upon their, what they understood to be remedies. So a remedy is composed, the word remedy is composed of two roots, re, for repeating, and med, which comes from madiri, which is to heal or to correct. So I think one of the things about folk remedies is that people use them because somewhere along the line, it worked. Someone used it more than once, probably. You can use it once, and if it works, very often you're likely to repeat it. And we're going to go into some of these because there's really so many. When I sat down to start writing about folk remedies, the list is almost endless. But as we <clears throat> look through these, I want you to be thinking about these seven questions what is the nature of illness, and how does the body actually heal an illness? And it's important to kind of understand that because uh, there's a famous quote, medica sonat naturis curat, which is the physician treats, but nature heals. So we can go to the doctor, we can go to the specialist and get the treatment, but is, does the treatment, like if the, the orthopedic doctor sets our broken bone, does he heal it? No, but he does do something very important in terms of making it straight so that you get a correct kind of healing. So there's, there's a role for the healer. What is, that's question number two. Role, what is the role of the healer? How does the healer participate in the healing process? That, to me, is a very important concept that uh, doctors really don't heal patients, but they participate in a way, or, or not just doctors, but anyone who's engaged in folk remedies or some kind of a healing process what are they doing that facilitates the natural healing process? Number three, how do folk remedies differ from conventional therapies? And an even more important question, how are they the same? How are they the same? And we'll, we'll kind of go into that in just a minute. Number four, are folk remedies valid? Just because it a fo it's a folk remedy, does that mean you should have a huge amount of distrust about it. I know a lot of people who trust their folk remedies a lot more than they do their conventional medicine remedies or treatments. Are folk remedies always safe? What, is, what are the downsides of using folk remedies? Number five, how do folk remedies differ from first aid? Is that really what a folk remedy is? Is it the thing you do before you go to see the doctor? Before you, I, I, the, the same doctor that I worked with you know, that uh, was talking about you get that patient in before they get well, he used to always say if, he, if a patient was really sick, he'd say, I need to send you to a real doctor. And so he had this feeling that he was participating in the, in the healing process, but if things got really complicated, okay, we're going to send you off to the specialist. So are we just doing a kind of first aid when we engage with uh, folk remedies? Number six, in what circumstances are folk remedies inappropriate? And when are they appropriate is the, uh, the other side of that. And I, I know from my uh, family practice training, one of the nephrologists that I admired once told me that the most important thing you'll learn in medical school is when is a patient really sick? Because a lot of us get sick, but when are we really sick? When are, when are, when are we dealing with a potentially lethal situation that needs a more aggressive intervention? And that's, 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 a very, that's not an easy question to answer, and a lot of it comes from just experience. Number seven, is it possible to determine the true effectiveness of a folk remedy? And that's, I think, the key question that I am kind of was trying to wrestle with in putting this presentation together is uh, how do we ever prove folk remedies? Is it, is it possible to? And I'm going to address that a little later on. I've got some books up here. So... Uh, now again, this I'm opening this up to kind of a discussion, and I'm I'm very and you know, please join in. You know, uh, this, there's no right or wrong answers here, so I think it's always interesting 
you know, what is your personal understanding of what causes illness? Why do people get sick? Um, and oftentimes there's a, there's a personal philosophy that you've developed around this, and maybe you haven't talked about it a lot. Sometimes it has a religious background. Sometimes it has a scientific background. Sometimes, you know, it has to do with, you know, lifestyle choices. Um, and how you feel about this very often will influence your, what I'm going to call your own personal paradigm of care. Each one of us walks around with a worldview about health and healing and what, what makes people sick, what makes them well, because oftentimes the choices we make in terms of our own health care has to do with our personal philosophy about what causes illness, because often, you know, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think the best thing to do in terms of dealing with a, any kind of an illness would be to treat the cause, right? Isn't that the most logical thing? If you've got a, as uh, Dr. Sidney Baker said, if you've sat on two tacks, he calls this tack theory, if you've sat on two tacks, does it make sense to take an aspirin or two? No, no, you, I mean, yeah, that's kind of treating the pain, but you want to kind of get to the underlying, literally underlying cause and remove the cause. Now that's very simple because that's a straightforward, you sat on some tacks, you pulled them out. But when you're talking about cancer, heart disease, arthritis, migraine headaches, there's a lot of chronic illnesses that it's just not real clear. What are the causes? Is it due to bad vapors, which is, you know, for the, the middle ages, I just saw a, a show on one of the educational channels um, that cholera, for, for, for a long time, everyone thought people were catching cholera from bad vapors. Well, we figured that one out. That's, that's, uh, that's water that's been infected with a bacteria. So there, there if, if you get cholera, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely upon rattles, you know, to try to induce a placebo effect. I, would, I think in that case, you would want to, first of all, have clean water, and you would want to you would want to have the correct antibiotic if, if, for example, there was a cholera epidemic, or you would want to sequester that bad water. But there we know pretty closely what's going on. But why do some people get the infection and other people's don't? And that has to do with you know maybe your internal resistance, your gut flora, your your state of nutrition. So causation, even though we can say that the germ caused the disease. Not everyone catches the disease. It's like during flu season, not everyone catches the flu. So can we say that the flu virus caused the disease? You can't because there's a participation between the, 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 the germ, the, the bacterial cause, and the health of the person's uh, immune system. So that's when you get into the health of the immune system. What about these things? Do you think someone who, um, who's been a bad person, are they more likely to get sick? I know some pretty healthy criminals out there. So uh, stress, that's, that's getting to be, who, how many of you in the room here think that stress sets you up for illness? I do, but, not, but all, we're all exposed to stress, but we don't always get sick. Bad water, bad food, how many, how many of you think that bad food can cause illness? Sure, but what, what constitutes bad food? There's, a, there's people that spend their whole lives eating, uh, you know, junk food and they, for some, are there, uh, you know, how, what about the guy that he's eating junk food, he's smoking, he's overweight, and he's fine, and the 50-year-old person that lives down the street eating the organic food gets cancer. What's the deal on that? You know, how many, I'm sure you've all heard that story that someone who was apparently taking good care of themselves, they catch some really bad disease. And so, uh, family curse, God's justice, I don't know, and, or mystery. I, I think there probably is, from the conventional perspective, the answer would be there is a series of causes. We just don't always know the full answer. And that's why, again, I say uh, it's really important on who you go to to help you figure out why you're sick, because I think the more you look at the broad spectrum of causes, the more likely you are to get to the to the basis of it. So these are some folk understandings, though. Uh, remedies originating from fermented foods. Remember I just mentioned about the banker who uh, took his apple cider vinegar. And By the way, is, is this any, did, did, does anyone know someone that has gotten better 
with apple cider vinegar and honey? Yeah. My mother. Your mother. What, what, how much? She had arthritis. She took it every morning. She took, how much did she take? Do you remember? Was it like a? I'm thinking it was a teaspoonful. And she put it in water and stirred it up? Yeah. And it, she never got crippled by her arthritis. Right. Interesting. Well, and there really are this, the, there, 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 there's a number of fermented foods that are now being seen as having really true health benefits, even though we're not, ex still not exactly sure how they help. But, you know, yogurt, how many of you eat yogurt or take kefir because of the good bacteria? That's a fermented food. How many of you drink beer or wine for health? <laughs> yeah. Of course, you can overdo it. You can overdo a good thing. And so that's obviously... The pickles is a real interesting one. There's a story of, uh, I had a patient that told me that he, she had an uncle that would eat about a jar of pickles every day. And he uh, ate hamburgers and he was a smoker and everything. And he was like in his upper 80s. And she kept wondering if it was the vinegar in the pickles that was, or maybe he was just pickled, I don't know. <laughs> so there, a lot of the, uh, like Korean kimchi, that's almost like a national treasure. They, when, when one of the Koreans went up on, uh, to the space station, they had to take kimchi up. It was that important to this Korean. So sauerkraut is pretty important to Germans, and sauerkraut, we now know, is a health food. How many of you know the theory behind sauerkraut? That it, it creates a type of acid, especially if you get the good fermented kind uh, that's done in a, I guess there's a proper way to do all this. It actually changes the pH of your gut such that you're more likely to have better gut flora. And we are learning that better gut flora is actually important in terms of immune function. As a matter of fact, the National Institute of Health has just started on their next big project. They finished the, the, uh, the, national ge or the, uh, the, the genome project, the human genome project, where they mapped out the human genome. They finished that, and they're doing some other side projects too, but, but now they're tackling another one. They're looking at the, uh, the human uh, biome project. Do you know what the human biome is? We humans have more bacteria in us than we have human cells. The gut flora, the friendly gut flora is is turning out to be almost like another organ. It, it participates in making neurotransmitters. It's necessary for helping the immune system. It's, it makes vitamins, vitamin K and various uh, biotin. Some of the B vitamins are made by the human gut flora. And in our day and age, it's kind of under attack because there's so many different antibiotics in the environment. They, they shoot up the, the, the dairy cows with penicillin. They, they, I mean, I, there was an article in the paper a couple days ago uh, the big controversy about putting uh, antibiotics in the feedlot feed, chickens, cows, and pigs, and is that creating the resistant strains of bacteria that we, we're having so much trouble with? And so uh, it turns out this human biome is, or the human biota is another, uh, another name they give it, is, a, is there may be thousands of friendly bacteria that we need to have in order to stay healthy. There's a, there's a a uh, lecture on the internet where this bacteriologist has said that when you look at the amount of DNA uh, in the bacteria that live on and in our bodies, there's about a hundred times more DNA coming from bacteria than DNA coming from human cells. So are we more bacteria or are we more human? That's what she asks. So anyway, the fermentation, the fermented foods are, is a really interesting question in the sense that uh, there's a book that I'd like to encourage all of you to look at sometime. It's called uh, Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. And what she did is she said, you know, s there's been a lot of changes in modern times and, and, and we've lost a lot of the traditional ways of preparing food. And fermenting foods was much more common in prior cultures because we didn't have refrigeration at that time and fermenting foods was a way of actually preserving foods as well. But she thinks that maybe some of these old food practices had healing properties. And if we would think about how to use foods in some of these traditional ways, that might help improve the health of, of, our, of people. And so I think that's where some of this comes into play. Uh, as time goes on, like, for example, chocolate. 
that uh, that's getting a much better press these days as far as a health food. Isn't that, you know, there is a God. Uh, <coughs> chocolate is a health food. Now, you can, you can have too much sugar in it. I think the, the company that the chocolate keeps sometimes is in question as far as healthiness. But chocolate itself uh, is a very healthy food. Miso, of course, the, uh, is, is very revered in uh, Japan. And I wanted to mention natto. Natto uh, is, is also sometimes called the food of the samurai. And so the samurai, supposedly, that if they ate their natto, they had, it gave them strength and, and uh, they were less likely to die in battle. And so, uh, and we've developed some, some supplements from natto. How many of you have heard of natto kinase? Natto kinase is a derivative of fermented soybean curd which is what natto is, and it's an, it's an enzyme that digests away excessive um, uh, uh, thickness of your blood. Uh, there's, there's something that you, in your blood called fibrinogen, which if you cut yourself, it converts to fibrin and you form a nice little clot and you don't bleed to death. But if you are sick with viruses and toxins and uh, heavy metals in your blood, you can inappropriately trigger the fibrinogen to convert to, at least to some fibrin and make your blood thick. And this thick blood may be a cause of chronic fatigue and set you up for a risk for heart disease. And by using natto kinase, you're digesting away the inappropriate fibrin in your blood. So there's, it's interesting, all these little traditional remedies uh, are beginning to show themselves as possibly having real implications in terms of maintaining health. Remedies involving detoxification. I'm sure you've all heard the, the, the word detoxification is showing up more and more. People are coming in now saying, I think I need to detoxify. How many of you have those days where you feel toxic? You know, just where you just feel yucky and uh, something's not quite right. And uh, it's true that uh, in our day and age, there are literally tens of thousands more environmental toxins in the environment than our ancestors ever were exposed to. And these are happening in very small quantities. And the, and the national agencies are saying, you know, it's too small to do any harm. It, this was part of the whole fluoride debate that recently happened here in Wichita. It was such a small dose, it's too small to do any harm. But what about bioaccumulation? What about the fact that these chemicals, like plastics and pesticides and herbicides, and other pollutants, uh, uh, they, they accumulate in the fat cells of the body. And I know a lot of people, when they go on a diet and they lose weight fairly quickly and their fat levels drop, they, they don't feel very good. So there is a detoxification you, you go through when you're, when you're uh, doing uh, some kind of a weight loss diet, especially one that helps you get rid of fat, not muscle. But look at all these other remedies that are here that can be used. And these these uh, used to be just kind of good things to do, like uh, getting a massage. Anyone here not want to have a massage? You know, most of the time it feels good. Well, our daughter in New York, old, uh, our oldest daughter, just finished a 1,400 hours of training, and she is now certified as a licensed massage therapist. And don't ever call her a masseuse. She, for, she takes great, I don't know, I, thought I got into trouble by saying, oh, you're, oh, so you're a masseuse now. Dad, no. I'm a licensed massage therapist. And then when we went to her graduation, she went, they went through a lot of the research that's being done. You can lower blood pressure. You can stop headaches. You can, do, you, know, you can adjust the spine, not intentionally, but as you balance out the muscles, the spinal uh, vertebrae balance out. So massage can be, and emotionally, it can be a source of detoxification, relaxation, stress reduction. So massage now is no longer just something that you do for the fun of it, it feels good. It's actually considered a medical, th most of your physical therapists have uh, massage therapists on staff these days. A lot of the chiropractors do as well. So is this a type of detoxification or is it just a kind of a feel good thing? And so this is what's, we're, we're, in, we're in the gray zone now of what is folk remedy and what is medical therapy because what we can do now, because of our scientific orientation, is we can take massage and monitor things that we would otherwise be using medicine for, like high blood pressure. Maybe someone who gets a regular set of massages, they don't need as much high blood pressure medicine. Maybe someone who gets a regular set of massages 
can go off their antidepressant. It's, you know, this is what can be done in terms of looking at what we called simple folk remedies and starting to see that they do have, uh, they, it does have medical implications. And I don't know, did you bring that book on integrative medicine? There's a whole book that has just recently been published. Uh, thank you, by doc, uh, Dr. David Rakel, where it's integrative medicine. And integrative medicine is nothing other than taking things like this, which we, in a former era, just thought of as kind of feel-good, folk remedy type things, and actually looking at the science behind them. And everything that's in here, all the, the herbs, all the various meditation, all the, all the various massage techniques, hypnosis, acupuncture, now they're applying the scientific method and they're giving levels of evidence. How, how good is the evidence for the different things? And it's turning out a lot of these things have very good evidence. And that's why we're seeing kind of a softening, I believe, of the medical profession as far as their attitudes towards alternative medicine and integrative medicine type therapies is because we're having the science come in and show that some of these things which we thought were just kooky stuff that that the weird people did uh, turns out they are things that actually do make a difference and most of these things if you look deep enough like at Ayurvedic medicine or Chinese medicine the more ancient forms of medical care they were there all along we just kind of lost them in our in our uh, rush to find uh, chemical pharmaceutical agents that would deal with diseases and and what we're finding out is that those are great short-term symptom relief technologies but when you're looking at long-term health you can't fool mother nature my my favorite analogy in this field is uh, actually comes from a book called the seven habits of healthy people by Stephen Covey I don't know how many of you've read that but uh, he, he says one of the worst things that's happened out of higher education is that we uh, will let a student goof off the whole semester and in the last three or four days before the final test, they'll cram. And then they'll go in, take the test, pass it barely, and they'll get a passing grade like, okay, they, they learned something in this class. And that, it, to me, it's like, that's like if you've not taken very good care of yourself and you go to the doctor and here's your medicine, this is going to fix everything. Well, what Covey says is that no, the human being is a biological system, which means that it's like farming. And a farmer cannot goof off the entire growing system, season and then in the very last instance somehow have a crop show up. A farmer has to plan, plant, cultivate, fertilize, you know, harvest, bring it in, sell the crop, you know, all the, all the various. There's a whole series of steps that are required when you're dealing with a biological system. We humans are biological systems. You can't just give us a chemical and say, okay, now you're healthy. You can, you can take a chemical and improve a symptom because you can basically po- you can poison some of this, the components that surround the symptom. But as far as building health, this is where I think the folk remedies kind of start to shine. Not to say that every folk remedy is a health building remedy, but many times they're using biological technologies or means of helping enhance the overall functioning of the person as a biological, and not only a biological, but a mind-body entity. We humans are not just biological machines. We have feelings. We uh, we, We have a history. We come from Uh, various family cultures or various national cultures and a lot of these folk remedies have a cultural identity to them as well like sauerkraut or the kimchi that there there's there are cultural factors involved in this as well that kind of give added strength to the remedy I'm going to get into that and this is this here we are the mind body remedies you know I think the fact that uh, if your grandma tells you to do something and you have a really close relationship with your grandma like for example your mother used used the uh, the apple cider vinegar have you used it yourself no <laughs> uh, but um, you mentioned pickles yeah and we ate a lot of pickles and stuff like that 
Yeah. So it was a kind of, of the vinegar. The vinegar as a, the, I call them the vinegar cures. There's a lot of these vinegar well, cures. Vinegar also was a, you had enough sure. Yeah. The acetic acid part of it can do a number of things. But the point here is, is that um, if someone of, someone that you either like, revere, mm -hmm. trust, or have some faith in, this is where they, we talk about faith healing, and, and many times in our day and age, that is the doctor, or that is the nurse practitioner, or that is someone of a medical orientation. We, we put a lot of faith in them, but oftentimes we'll put faith in uh, an alternative practitioner as well. I know some people say they're, they've got the best massage therapist in the world. They, they give the massage therapist a lot of credit. Acupuncturists, uh, Chinese medicine. There's a, there's a lot of alternative type therapies that people put a tremendous amount of faith in and they've gotten good results. Now here I'm kind of talking about other types of healing. These are almost the, uh, the faith healings. And it's, it's interesting. I would say a lot of the patients I, I talk to, they, prayer is still one of the top ways that they believe that this is how they're going to get better and they wouldn't dare just go to the doctor. They're going to, they're going to say a prayer. You know, in a, or they're going to do a rosary, or uh, maybe they're going to get their favorite saint out and say a prayer to the favorite saint. Uh, there's all kinds of mind-body factors that go into folk remedies. So don't ever take away that, what I call the, the it's not only the remedy, but it's how it's imbued by the patient, or by the, the, the healer that's offering it. For example, uh, the doctor writes the prescription. Here's the penicillin. It's not only the penicillin, it's the fact that this doctor who you trust, who maybe has been your family doctor, has said this is what you need to do. That does something. That, that invokes something, uh, part of this, what I call the human healing response. So you need to, you need to kind of keep that in mind. Now, you can't fake that. You know, you can't say, well, just because a doc he's a doctor, I think he's okay. You know, there's a lot of people that just because they're a doctor, he's not okay. You know, I've got, I've got that side of the coin as well that, of patients that I see. But I think there is something about how our mind and our body interact when we're making a decision whether or not to use a special remedy. And that is part of the human healing response. So, uh, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different things. Like, for example, kinesiology. How many of you have been to a kinesiology uh, chiropractor? I mean, they're, they're using a, t a technique, it's an energy technique that's really hard to objectify, but they can get consistent results. And so, but, it's, but from a Western point of view, it's tough to figure out exactly what they've done. But if they've, if they've gotten good results with you and you're better, that's hard to argue as well. And we come back to, this is one of the, to me, one of the key things about folk remedies that kind of keep them in the loop is that if it gets a result, it's got to be worth something. It's, you, it's hard to argue success. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, were you going to get better anyway? Or was it just chance? And I know that uh, a lot of modern medicine has to do with double-blind placebo-controlled studies to try to rule that part out, to try to see, see if it really was an objective healing versus the uh, bringing in the whole... Uh, uh, placebo effect, but I, it's almost too bad because uh, to me, I think we should, we should embrace placebo. I mean, thank God we have that innate ability to heal and we should find ways that we're not fooling ourselves, but that we're, we're, we're uh, using that innate capability of enlisting the immune system, the nervous system, the mind-body system to bring about stronger and more effective healing effects. And, I'm, and I'm, that's my, in a way, my criticism of modern medicine is that we're getting further and further away from human touch and human contact and the ability to kind of interact in such a way that we develop that faith. It's becoming more of a business and more of a technology rather than the art of medicine. This is just, some of these charts are kind of just interesting just to show you the, the scope of of uh, natural remedies, there's all these different kinds of waters that are out there now these days. And some of them are very, tr like Lourdes, it's a very famous uh, uh, area in, I think in, is it Portugal? 
where you can go and it's just huge. My wife was there this, just this past year and, and really thousands and thousands of people go to Lourdes for healing. Uh, but all the various herbal teas, you know, using holy water, of course, uh, purity of water like reverse osmosis can make a difference. Juicing is really coming back into vogue. I, I, it's, not, it's more than just a water, obviously. Uh, Micro-clustered water, we saw a presentation where there's, a, there's something called Kangen water where you can um, uh, treat it electronically and it alkalinizes it. And the guy put the tea bag in it and the tea went boom, right into the water. And I thought, whoa. And he says it's because they've broken apart the clustering of the molecules. And so it's much easier for the water to move into the tea and, and become uh, tea. You didn't even have to heat it up. So, so there's a lot of different things that, uh, and, and plus there is a symbology there that water equates with life, water equates with healing. And a lot of the, a lot of the various detoxification remedies use some degree of uh, healing or bathing or cleansing as a way of improving your health. <coughs> remedies inv uh, involving human touch. So this kind of gets me back to my comment earlier that we're losing touch with the, the art of healing. And uh, even as kids, if you bumped your head, mom would kiss the owie, right? Is that a folk remedy? Or it certainly seems to work. Uh, now, obviously, if, if they got a huge laceration, it's, you're going to need to go to the ER. But, uh, but uh, a lot of the traditional approaches to the laying on of hands or just putting your hands on someone or, or talking to someone. I was actually taught, and I, th I think it's one of the more significant things that I learned, was when I see a patient to be sure and shake hands, make contact. And nowadays with all the machines, doctors don't even hardly use their stethoscopes anymore. And we're, we're having a kind of a, a loss of touch, losing touch with uh, the healing, natural healing ways. And so, so we're back to massage. Uh, even sexuality, the right kind of sexuality can be a type of touch that can be very healing. Dr. Reardon was a big hugger, you know, eight hugs a day in order to be healthy. Uh, and then there is a whole area called th therapeutic touch. There are nurses that are tra specially trained to do a type of uh, therapeutic touch that they, for a while there, they were active at, uh, via Christie Hospital. I don't know if they're still there, but we, we've had therapeutic tr touch training uh, sessions here at the clinic. So as people crave that human touch in order to promote more of a healing process, I think we see the touch-oriented therapy starting to come back and, and more reliance upon that uh, as we move along. So we do know that uh, life is such that things get broken, uh, always do occur. Toxicity seems to be a natural part of the world. Uh, trauma, whether it's uh, physical trauma or emotional trauma, seems to be prevalent in our culture. Uh, frustration, disappointment, illness, sickness, drama. So I think the, the craving to have ways to deal with this brokenness of life is part of the whole folk remedy thing. And folk remedies are more than just uh, things that you do for just physical ailments. I think people turn to them for psychological and spiritual relief as well. Are they safe? Uh, I think this is where most of the, the true folk remedies, when you're, when you're talking about, for example, um, the... Uh, uh, apple cider vinegar, there's a whole little book here on arthritis and folk medicine, all the various ways that you can approach that before you get into strong medication. Some of the strong medications are not totally safe. You know, the, the uh, NSAIDs have to be used with caution. Uh, Tylenol can be a little hard on your liver. So, so it makes sense if you've got a long-term chronic illness to start looking for what else can you do to help your body participate in a healing process. Um, oftentimes they are mysterious. Uh, no one exactly knows what the mechanism is, though uh, over time they, I think we are taking modern medicine and science and beginning to investigate into the mechanisms of these traditional remedies. I think that's the exciting 
part of modern medicine is that what used to be just voodoo, if we, if we, can, if we can look and test, actually the pharmaceutical companies have helped us to understand uh, what uh, the, these mechanisms are in terms of uh, the in inflammatory pathways. Much of what we know now about herbs treating inflammation, that came about because of uh, the research that was done on the anti-inflammatory medications. And then we applied that same research to the effects of those herbs on uh, the inflammatory pathways. So uh, overall though, I, I, I think uh, one of the reasons that I think a person can at least investigate the, the uh, folk remedies is because they do have a safe, generally a safety factor built in. Now there is a danger, and the danger is, and this goes back to what I said earlier, that if you have a serious illness and you go too far with just folk remedies, maybe you've, you've passed a certain point at which a conventional uh, remedy or treatment would be appropriate. So we're talking here about cancer. We might be talking about someone that has angina heart pain, uh, someone who has abdominal pain that may be thinking they just have uh, food poisoning when in reality they might have like a, a ruptured diverticulum or something that could theoretically become very serious. And so, so there is this balance between uh, relying upon traditional remedies and using standard medical care. And I think this is where you have to use common sense. So we're just about out of time here. The diets, I, I mentioned that uh, there's a lot of, this, this, this is just a very, very small chart because there are literally, I think at one point someone counted and there are like over 800 different diets people use mostly for losing weight, but they also use them, you know, the arthritis diet, the, the headache diet, uh, you know, you have diets for, for acne, you have diets for all kinds of reasons. The cancer diets, there's, all, there's a number of different cancer diets, and it's very hard to do double-blind placebo-controlled trials on diets. And so that's where you have to look at the general mechanisms that are at the basis of how these work or what's being attempted in the, the various approach and, and you know, does it make sense in terms of our best understanding of the mechanism of the disease. For instance, uh, the Gerson diet is a lot of juicing, but it's very high in potassium. So it helps people who are, who have, uh, cancer patients are very often their chemistry is, has shifted very acidic and so a Garrison diet is, is very alkalinizing, and so you're kind of neutralizing some of the effects of cancer. Plus, the Gerson diet involves a lot of uh, colorful fruits and vegetables, so we know that phytonutrients uh, act as very powerful antioxidants, and so using something like that could be beneficial in terms of dealing with uh, a cancer patient. The wart remedies, I kind of brought this up. Uh, I first read about these again in Dr. Andrew Weil's book, Natural Health, Natural Medicine, and he has a big section in here on uh, wart remedies, and um, they almost all work to a certain degree, and in, in certain other instances, none of them work. Uh, and I know even conventional doctor's remedies where you go in and have your wart burnt off, it'll grow back. So you generally have to get the immune system involved. Now what Dr. Weil, Andrew Weil, has said, it's really interesting. He says if you can get a remedy that the patient believes in and treat what he calls the mother wart, all the other warts will go away. So that's got to be an immune response, but it's an immune response involving the mind-body. It's where you have to get your psychoneuroimmunologic faculties working but you can't fake belief. And so this is the tricky part of this. So some of this has to make sense to you and has to resonate with your personal philosophy, your paradigm of healthcare, in order for it to, to make the most sense to you. What are the conventional doctor's attitudes towards folk remedies? Well, they, they would rather see everything have double blind placebo controls trials. And I've always said the trouble with double-blind placebo-controlled trials, it's kind of like if you're doing a parachute study, who wants to uh, volunteer for the placebo? 
Think about it. <clears throat> okay. A lot of doctors are actually hostile towards uh, folk remedies, like they are totally worthless. They, they don't, if it's not in the medical books, it, it has no effect whatsoever. And I always think that's weird because uh, a lot of the patients that come in and tell their doctors about a folk remedy, they're telling them because it did work. It worked, and maybe it worked several times, but the doctor says, no, nah, that's just an anachronism. No one's doing, you know, the only thing that we can do that we know for sure is here's the double-blind placebo-controlled trial on the, on the drug or the surgery or the, the medical intervention. Now, again, you have to find the right context for what, what you're deciding to do. So, and this is where doctors believe that oftentimes people that have too much faith in a folk remedy, they're setting themselves up for a potential disaster if they have a condition that really should be seen by the doctor and treated and the patient lets it go too long, uh, that, that could be a big problem. Now that, I'm sure that does happen, but I think the vast majority of the time, if it's, a, if it's a, not a significant illness, very often people do a great job of taking care of themselves before they rush in to see the doctor. Then there are those patients that, um, there was a, there was a, there was a, um, cartoon that I saw where the doctor was looking at this guy's uh, finger and he says, yeah, it does look like a paper cut, but we'll run some tests just to be sure. <clears throat> um, spontaneous remissions. I've always said that my goal here when working with patients using whatever approach that we can put together that makes sense for that individual patient, the purpose of that is to induce a spontaneous remission. Uh, nutritional remedy, uh, nutritional medicine or folk remedies. This kind of gets us to the Reardon Clinic because we have been accused of just engaging in vitamin folk remedies. And I wanted to show you uh, the book that just came out um, this last year, Dr. Alan Gaby's 1,600 page book with like over 45,000 references. There is plenty of research documenting that nutritional remedies do work, but the thing that's different, though, is that they don't work in the same way that a medicine works, and you have to individualize therapy. We use our laboratory to kind of give us a, an edge. If, we, if we've measured someone low in a nutrient, it's more likely to be beneficial to them. But we try to use the best science that we know, but to me, the real success of what goes on here is that having that personal contact with people, understanding their unique situation, what their own personal philosophy is, knowing what we know about nutrients, and matching the patient up with the best and safest therapy that we can do to help them overcome whatever their chronic illness is. So, um, but it, if you're not trained in that, if you don't have that kind of a background in your medical school training, it doesn't matter that this research is here. I mean, if you talk to a lot of doctors, they'll still say there's not enough research. There's, you know, but they, it's, it's also a paradigm of care, a methodology of how to deal with chronically ill patients. So, I really think there needs to be a subspecialty of nutritional medicine or clinical, med clinical nutrition in a, that teaches allopathically trained doctors to make good use of nutrient therapy and possibly to make good use of all these things that we've talked about today. And that, that may be what integrative medicine is, is, is taking folk medicine and home remedies and, and safe natural therapies and putting them into a medical context so that they're more appropriately use, utilized by uh, patients and doctors. So what's your verdict? Is, is our folk remedies real or are they just our imagination that we just happen to get better and it's just by chance and by golly and by luck? <laughs>